we'll continue from where we left off yesterday. So yesterday, if you recall, I talked a little bit about how people are trying to uh, implement Bayesian inference algorithms in uh, uh, models of uh, neural networks. And the idea was to relate that the data that's been collected from animals uh, and humans, and animals uh, looking at data from particular areas of the brain. Uh, what I'll do today is try to connect that to the ultimate purpose of uh, in uh, inference and ultimate purpose of perception, which is actions. Right? So how do you use information that you get from your sensors to uh, then uh, perform actions that will perhaps uh, give you some rewards? Right? So let's look at uh, this fundamental problem that we're facing, which is you know, if you're an animal, you're uh, you know, trying to get some food. So there's a gazelle, and it's trying to graze. Right? So uh, uh, it has to decide where to graze. So maybe it's, it's, it's found a nice little patch you know, with its uh, mates. And so, uh, but it also has to be very careful. Right? So what if there's a predator that's lying around? So, if it actually finds a good patch and it's careful and so on, uh, there's, uh, if it's able to handle the uncertainty in terms of what the sensors are telling it um, and what its, uh, its, its mates are telling it, then maybe uh, it gets to graze for a while and gets its fill and you know, it can have a CSN after and so on. But uh, the, the other side of that picture is if it's not really handling the uncertainty correctly, then it might face situations such as this one, right? Not really a very boring situation for a for animals. So basically, there's a trade-off there in terms of how much you trade off the uncertainty in a particular situation with the, uh, the rewards and the penalties that, that you might get. So you always have to keep that in mind. Uh, similarly, this could be a sport, right? It doesn't have to be an animal. It could be a human sport. Uh, do we know what that is? You might date yourself if you, I have to uh, warn you that you might date yourself if you identify the person, right? So, but you, you already did that. So John McEnroe, right? Uh, so this is actually a very famous uh, tennis player from, uh, I guess, the 1980s, right? Um, uh, so, so in the case of tennis, right, again you have uncertainty in terms of the, you know, where exactly the, the opponent is going to put the, uh, the ball, what kind of stroke you, you, you're actually going to execute. Oh, and in this so case, on. whether you throw the racket that you... Ah! <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the opponent's problem, not his problem, right? Uh, but yeah, so I mean, in this case, again, there's, there's rewards, such as you might win the, uh, you know, the Wimbledon or, or, or the uh, US Open. Uh, or the umpire, right? But, uh, on the other hand, I mean, there's, uh, you might also not judge the, uh, the shot very well, and you might end up with a situation such as that, but that he was really known for that kind of behavior, right? The racket is still his hand, so uh, it's actually a better situation than most. Um, but, uh, so basically, again, in sports, you have the same uh, problem of uh, having to deal with the uncertainty of not just, you know, the, uh, there might be the, the wind might change the direction of the ball in addition to the spin that your opponent is going to put on it and so on. So you have to figure out how you're going to trade off that kind of uncertainty and, and, and see if, if you're actually going to win the point or not. Uh, and finally, even sort of uh, higher level cognitive planning, such as you're taking your family out to the beach, right? Uh, so you have to basically negotiate traffic, uh, and at the same time, you also have to figure out where exactly uh, there might be something like a traffic jam. So you might end up in a situation such as this, especially if you have your family with you, you have a kid, you're going to have uh, to deal with all the consequences of that, and your consequences and so on. Uh, but uh, yeah, the other side of that is you might actually end up in the beach and you might actually have a good time, right? So you have to trade off rewards versus the kind of penalties that you might get through a game. Even in this sort of higher level, uh, you know, cognitive sort of process where you have to figure out which roads to take and so on, right? So since we can't really study um, decision making and, and uh, how people deal with uncertainty in these kinds of situations, obviously you can't do experiments on your family. Uh, you could do something really simple, which is a task like this one. We already encountered this last time. This is the so-called random dots uh, task that people have used in humans and monkeys uh, <clears throat> to actually figure out how does the brain deal with uncertainty when it actually has to make a decision. Right? So uh, for those of you who might not have seen this before, the idea is uh, you have to decide the direction of motion of a bunch of dots and you can control the amount of uncertainty by changing what is called the coherence, which is the number of dots that are moving in any particular two frames in the same direction. And for 100% coherence, all the dots are moving in the same direction, 0%, none of them are. 50%, 50% of them are selected at any point in time and moved in one particular direction. Uh, and so you get things such as this, so for 5% coherence, this is something I showed you yesterday, just to jog your memories. Uh, you might get something like that. It's, you know, if you practice well, you can tell that the dots are moving in a particular direction. Uh, but if you make it easier, so you can make the task easier, reduce the amount of noise, and so the uncertainty is reduced here, and you can see clearly that the dots are moving right. And so it gives you a nice way of titrating the uncertainty of the, uh, uh, the stimulus and then seeing how the brain decides uh, based on the amount of information that it's getting at any point in, in time. Uh, it's amazing to me. So yesterday I couldn't do this. Ah. But now that I know that there is only a small subset that goes in the same direction in this first case, uh. I can do it. All right. <laughs> 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 You're being trained. <laughs> 
And also, I mean, did you sleep last night? Because <coughs> that helps. I mean, sleep helps in consolidating memory and skill learning. That's been shown. So. And you have a laptop now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that helps also. Yeah. So, so here's what you, this, this is what people have done in Monkey. So, obviously, you have to train the monkey, right? The monkey is not going to do this task uh, without some training. So, what they do is they essentially have the monkey strapped up in a chair, such as this one. Um, and then they have wires uh, or electrodes. These, these are uh, uh, platinum uh, sort of insulated wires that are, that are put in a particular area that you want to record from. And, uh, <clears throat> and then you have to train the monkey, right? So you have a, a juice reward mechanism that gives it drops of uh, uh, juice if it, if it answers correctly. So in this case, if it uh, correctly tells you the direction of motion, uh, then you, you give it a little bit of juice reward. If it makes an error, then you, you have a penalty in this case. Uh, you know, it's not something dramatic like shocking the monkey, that would be illegal, right? So they actually give it a delay, so that there's a delay and then it gets to do the next trial. So it has incentives to actually do the task correctly, learn the task. It might take a while for you to train the monkey, but people have done it, and in this case, I think it might take a few months, or maybe uh, if it's a smart monkey, uh, a few weeks, to learn this particular task. And once it's, uh, uh, so here's what the task looks like. So you have the monkey uh, fixating on a particular point on the screen. There's a particular, uh, something called RF, that's called the receptive field. So if you're recording from a brain cell, it tends to like one particular area of the visual field, and that's given by the patch over there. And then there, uh, you put two targets, so on the left and right side, and the monkey has to make an eye movement to the left or the right one, depending on its decision. So if it thinks the dots are moving to the right, it has to make an eye movement to the right dot. Uh, if it thinks the dots are moving to the left, it has to make an eye movement to the left. And that's the task. And then the motion comes on, you have the dots moving, and then you have the saccade, which is basically the fast eye movement to the left or right. Uh, and you can measure the reaction time, the RT is the reaction time it takes. So depending on the amount of noise, it'll take longer or shorter to make that eye movement. Right? So uh, everybody can with that. That's just the paradigm of the experiment that you can use to test the behavior of the monkey. And so once you've done that, then you can record from the brain area that you're interested in and see how the brain is actually uh, processing this particular uh, information during the task. Okay, so, so here are some of the brain areas that have been implicated in this particular visual decision-making task. So the information from the eyes uh, eventually gets to the visual cortices, which are at the back of your head. And then there's uh, other areas that are more abstract uh, processing areas, such as this area LIP. Uh, that's on the top of your head, and then the something called the frontal eye fields, and finally the superior colliculus is where you have the mechanisms for making the eye movement to the left or to the right. Okay? So let's look at the responses in one particular area called the LIP area. And this is where there's been a lot of suggestion that there's these decision neurons, decision making neurons that are uh, residing for these visual tasks that, that you can record from here. So here's an example of a, I'll give you examples of uh, one neuron responding to both, uh, to two directions. So like yesterday, what you'll hear is the, the neuron firing. So it'll, it'll go crack, 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 crack. That's basically the pulses. Uh, and I'll, I'll again repeat this. Try that again. Oops. So, so you'll see the, so do you see the stimulus uh, coming up? And then as the stimulus comes up, <coughs> go to the very bottom, so you can't see very clearly here, but you can see these, these lines there. And you can see that as the stimulus comes on, the, the number of lines increases. That means that the, 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 the neuron is spiking faster as the dots come out. And then when the, when the stimulus goes off, then you might have a little bit of slowing of the, of the firing, and then it goes away. So what this particular brain cell likes is to see the dots moving, in this case, to the upper right. And then it will make an eye movement to that uh, red dot on the upper right. And in the other case, I'm going to show you at the bottom when the uh, uh, movement is in the opposite direction, it will actually reduce its, its activity. So. So it becomes silent, actually, when the dots are moving in the opposite direction. So it's very selective towards the direction of motion of the dots. If it's, uh, the dots are moving to the upper right, which is its preferred direction of motion, it will start increasing its activity, it gets very excited, and you see a lot more spikes. And in the opposite direction, it gets reduced, and so it gets suppressed and doesn't uh, spike as much. So you'll see uh, it less like. Okay? Uh, is there any explanation of why is it selective towards a specific direction? Yeah, so there's a lot of work that's been done on how exactly it gets to this particular stage. Uh, what I'll give you is uh, one interpretation of this particular activity, but mechanistically, there's, uh, you, can, you can build up a uh, model of the processing stages right from the retina all the way up to this particular brain area, of how it becomes selective for the direction of motion. Uh, and then the, the big challenge, of course, is to then say, how does it actually get to the point where this is used for making a decision about the direction of motion? So here's what the summary looks like. So you can see that if you plot the firing rate, which is basically you take all those pipes, those lines, and you average that over multiple trials, and then you can 
come up with a, a, a defining way as a function of the noise in the stimulus, which is called the motion strength or the coherence. So you can see that the, uh, <coughs> the, the noisier the stimulus, the, the slower the rise to uh, some particular value of the firing rate, right? So the, for example, for 0%, there's, 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 there's not much of a rise. And then uh, for the 51%, there's a really rapid rise to the uh, top of that, that, that curve of that particular graph. Uh, and so this is actually uh, uh, a way in which people have suggested that the, uh, uh, the reaction time of the monkey can be explained because you can say that if it reaches really a, a particular uh, threshold faster, then it's going to respond faster. If it takes a long time to ramp up, then it might uh, uh, take a longer. Uh, it takes a longer time to react to the to the stimulus. So we'll get to this in, in just a minute. But that's just the data that, that people have collected uh, for this particular task. And the traditional model has been a random walk type of model. So you can explain that data by using something called a drift diffusion model, where you assume that. Uh, there's this, 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 this so-called decision variable that is uh, diffusing uh, uh, over time, and then there's uh, some evidence from the uh, census, in this case the images for the random dot stat, that is giving you some uh, deflections, some bias towards the, the top or the bottom part, a part of this, uh, uh, this graph. And if it reaches a particular threshold uh, uh, at the top, that's, a, that's the decision saying it's left. If it's uh, going downwards, and then it's going to go towards the decision rightwards. So it's a very uh, descriptive model. So it's a it's a model that you can look at as a way of describing the phenomenon that people have observed in the brain. But what we're uh, looking for is a normative model, which is what, what is the best way of solving this problem, right? So if you give this problem to a, uh, um, uh, a computational person, right? So how would they design or engineer a system that will solve this particular problem in an optimal way, where optimality has to be defined in, in some particular, right, with a particular criteria? And the question then is, is the brain being optimal or not, right? Where optimality depends on your uh, reward function and so on. Okay, so, so let's, let's ask those two questions. So uh, what is the optimal way of, of solving this particular problem or this task? And, uh, and how can a monkey or I guess an agent of your in AI or computer science, how does it actually learn to solve the problem given only examples and, and trial and error, right? So rewards and penalties and so on. So there's a, a, an area of, of research in AI called PromDPs and what, what does this really mean? So it basically stands for partially observable uh, Markov decision processes. And uh, the idea is actually uh, uh, not as, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, formidable as it sounds. I mean, it, it, the word, you know, partially observable Markov decision process is a big mouthful. But really, the idea is that there's a world out there that's, that's basically the, the physical world that is behaving in some particular way, given by, in this case, a very simple uh, Markov dynamics. That's given by this transition property uh, distribution, P of S prime given S and A. So you're assuming that the world is changing as a consequence of your own action, which is A as well as its previous state, and it's given by the simple uh, dynamics that's shown on the right. And each point in time, you're going to get some measurement or observation that's, that's given by this, you know, the, it's basically the likelihood function. So given a particular state, it generates some particular observation that you can measure. Uh, and then uh, finally, the, there's some reward you might get uh, at any point in time, and that's given by this, this reward function. Okay, so these are the three different parameters that you assume uh, in this particular model. And, this is, and then you, you can take an action based on your observation and reward that you get, and that allows you then, that, that, that changes the world in some particular way, and then you get the next observation and the next reward. And the reward could be zero, which means you don't get an actual reward, or it could be a negative or a positive uh, value, which could be a food reward or, uh, or some other kind of reward. Okay. And this stops after the reward is zero? No, I mean, in general, it's, it goes on forever until you die, right? I mean, basically, it's a, it's a, it's a loop that goes on forever, right? Uh, but you can think of it as uh, you can have episodic uh, tasks where things go on and then the trial ends and the new trial begins, which is that what we had before uh, in, in this particular random dots task. Um, you could have a rat in a maze, for example, that's trying to get some cheese in the maze. So that's a classical reinforcement learning task. And so in that case, it wanders around the maze for a while, finds the, the food, eats the food, and that's the end of that particular trial and so on. Okay, so. So this is actually a very uh, a common framework in um, artificial intelligence, that they've used it in robotics and so on. Um, and obviously there's a lot of simplifications here, so the world is not going to behave always in this really simplistic way where it depends only on the previous state and the previous action. And uh, maybe your observations are not just a function of a single state and so on, but this is actually a good first attempt at trying to capture this behavioral aspect of how do perceptions and actions relate to rewards and, and changes in the, in the dynamics of the world. Uh, and you can think of these two as sort of capturing the physics of the world in some sense, right? So this is basically the dynamics of the state that's hidden from you, and this is the measurement process. So how does the state of the world relate to the measurements you're making with your sensors? Okay? So how, how do you cast this really simple task as a, as a POMDP, or this, this, uh, this Markov decision process? Well, here's 
uh, one example, right? So you could say, okay, the states are unknown that you're trying to figure out. This is basically, in this case, left versus right, right? It's a pretty uh, simple way of doing that. Uh, what about the observations? Observations are the images, right, that you're seeing, right? So it's just the images of the dots and the motion. Uh, what about the actions? What kind of actions do you think the monkey has, or you have? Make the choices, left and right. But there's also one more action, sort of implicit, right, which is nothing, right? So you might want to wait to sample one more time step. Right? And that's an important one, because if you're not ready to take an action yet of left or right, then you might just sit and wait and get some more data, right? So you might get more data and then finally decide later on. So this is a very simple uh, kind of uh, three, set, three actions that you might use to figure out at what point you actually make a decision given all the data you've seen so far, right? So let's go with that. So mm -hmm. these movies are not a fixed length, they just keep going yeah. for as long as Yeah, that's long right, long that's long right, long. that's right. Yeah, these are reaction time tasks. You can, they also have a fixed duration version of the task, but this is a, uh, 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 basically it goes on. I mean, you'll see that there's actually, the monkey will make a decision at some point because uh, that turned out to be the optimal thing to do, right? It won't go on forever. Yeah? Okay. The same experiment is being repeated again. What's that? The same experiment is being repeated again. So as a monkey sees it, lead that with the plus, uh, with the increase of time. Yeah. The firing of neuron decreases like that because he is already experienced about the situation that it's like this. So it's easier for him to make the decision that it's moving. So does it influences the neural time? Yeah, so I mean, I guess you were talking about the learning process. So as it's uh, learning the task, right, you do see changes in the neuron firing. But uh, typically all the data I'm showing you is, is after it's been overtrained on the task, it's been really learned it really well. <coughs> so then all it's doing is using whatever it's learned to figure out what point in time it, it needs to stop and decide whether it's left or right. So basically it's, it's already learned the task, so there's no changes in that aspect of the, of, the, of the firing of the neurons. Yeah? So can the monkey rig the system by just gambling very fast on one of the directions and just getting the Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll see some exam. I mean, we won't see examples of that, but basically you can, you can test all of that by, for example, changing the prior probability of the, the directions of motion or changing the reward that you give it and so on. Like you might even give it a less reward or more reward for one particular direction and so on. So there are ways. And so it's possible that there's some monkeys that at some point they might just decide you know, to help with it, right? We'll just like, yeah. randomly select. So uh, that wouldn't be optimal behavior, but you know, maybe it is optimal with respect to a particular reward function that the monkey is using at that point in time. Right? They, use so, a, they use a, a delay, right? Yeah, so. Depending on size, size that's right. of the delays that they made. Yeah, so in order to motivate the monkey to not make errors, they, they introduce a, a delay. So every time it makes an error, there's a delay where it doesn't get to go to the next trial. Uh, it has to wait for a while. So that usually prevents them from yeah. just randomly yeah. guessing. Like a these numbers are not so realistic because in these yeah. numbers you think your reward is ten times. Yeah, I mean but these are just arbitrary. Right, right. So, right. so uh, I, I didn't talk about this, but basically uh, in this problem diffie framework, you have to give some values for quote unquote rewards. And so you could say, for example, for a correct choice, there's some <coughs> positive, positive value, and then for a negative, uh, uh, you can have for a wrong choice. If you make an error, you get a, a penalty, just like that delay that I talked about. Uh, and then also there's an interesting sort of penalty for uh, encouraging the monkey to, to, to not delay forever. So you could have like a, a minus one for each time it spends sampling. So this is sort of like simulating uh, a hunger or thirst, right? So basically if it waits for too long, it's going to get more and more hungry or more and more thirsty. So it cannot afford to do that. So there's some internal, this is like an internal reward, right? It's like an internal penalty for not waiting too long, right? But the optimum somehow depends on, on this ratio. Right? Yeah, that's right. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, exactly this kind of waiting not for a long time, the right. basically uninformed decisions will, right. uh, if, if, the, if the negative uh, reward is right. small, will be in favor. That's right, yeah. So one thing that we can do, this is one of the nice things about this kind of a framework is that you can change the ratio. Uh, basically the ratio would be the, you know, you can look at the, the ratio of the correct minus the, uh, the, the, the positive versus the negative uh, divided by the, the, the time penalty, for example. That's one ratio you can look at. And so you can look at how that affects the behavior. So by changing that ratio, you can make predictions about uh, what the behavior would be, or you can go backwards and say, okay, given this monkey, here's what the ratio should be for this monkey, right? So you can essentially figure out the, the reward function that the monkey might be using according to this model, sort of doing a reverse engineering of the reward function. Yeah? Uh, I thought the uh, form did six parameters. I got only four parameters. Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, there are many variations of that, right? So what I'm giving you is a, uh, one example of, uh, of this framework. Uh, that, that's okay for this, this particular uh, task, but yeah, you could have other variations with more parameters. Yeah. Uh, so here's the, um, the component that you would need to solve this problem, right? So one is the actual state of the world is unknown. So 
The only way you can make decisions is by maintaining a probability distribution over the hidden variable, which is in this case the state. And you have access to all the previous actions you've taken, all the observations you made. So you can compute what is called a belief state, which is this B of T. It's basically the posterior probability distribution over the hidden states of the world. And so you can compute that based on all the observations you've received and all the actions uh, you've taken. And what is the goal? Well, one goal you could say is to maximize the expected reward, right? You, 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 the expected reward over all time steps, so time step t equals zero all the way up to uh, potentially infinity, right? And since that's going to be an infinite sum, people typically use this gamma over here, which is a discount factor, so it's a number between zero and one. And so if you have a, a finite task, like an episodic task, then you, you might just set that equal to one, but in general, it's set to some, some value that's, that's less than one so that the, the sum doesn't become uh, infinite. Okay, so that's like a parameter that you could also then use to fit to a particular person or model. You could say that person's discount factor is you know, 0.5 and some other person is 0.9 and so on. Uh, but basically the idea is you want to maximize the expectation of this, this sum of rewards that you're getting. And the way you do that is by picking the right action. So the action is a function of the entire belief state, which is B, right? So phi is a function that's typically called a policy. So the whole goal here is to find the policy that maximizes the expected reward, right? You kind of map your belief states, so all the beliefs you might have at any point in time, to the appropriate actions, so that eventually you end up maximizing the reward. Yeah. So this is a very good question I asked tutorial. I think this, this idea, of, again, this infinite uh, uh, yeah. number. So the, the monkey has to sort of that infinity is not real, and the monkey actually has no reason to believe that it's going to go on forever. In fact, all its experience has its few trials. Yeah. And so, how long does it take for the monkey to figure out the reward system? If you change it, how long does it readjust? Right, right. So, so this actually is more of a theoretical con construct, right? So you could rewrite this by just saying, okay, I just want to do it for some finite amount of time. Or so I'm asking in practice, what yeah. would that number be? <laughs> what would the, uh, the amount of time be for... Uh, How uh, many for the times does the monkey think that this thing is going to go on so that it can maximize all the guys, even if it's optimal, right? Right, right. How long does it... How does it yeah. Yeah, so, so I mean, in, in general, I mean, you'll see that uh, even though that's, that, that says infinity, the, the actual policy itself, right, is, is going to actually have a limit, a time limit to it, because that's the optimal thing to do in this case is not to wait forever, but to, at some point in time, it becomes better for you to randomly guess and end the trial and go to the next one, even if it's going to end, uh, end up being a bad uh, choice. So that's, that's what turns out to be the optimal thing to do. So you'll see that in the, in the end, that's not really a factor, right, in terms of the policy itself. The, the action to take. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So here, this t is just the number of time steps in a single trial. It's not yeah. the number of trials over which it's collecting. No, no, it's, it's the number of uh, time steps that the uh, animals experience okay. uh, at, at any point in time. Yeah. The SC is a background noise. Was that? SC is a background noise. Yeah. So I mean, SC. Well, I'm just using that as a state estimator. So it's basically the equation you use to update the belief uh, based on all the observations you've got and all the actions you've taken. No, I'm saying that SC is a background noise. A background noise. Well, it's, it's basically the algorithm that computes it. So I'll come to that in just a minute. So what exactly is this, this so-called state estimator? Right? So, so here's the three different uh, uh, components you need to have if you're really solving uh, uh, this problem of actions uh, using this model. So you have to, first of all, be able to compute the beliefs using some neural network. And then you have to be able to compute the expected reward. So people call that the value. The value of any particular belief is given by this V. Uh, you have to compute that from rewards. And finally, uh, you have to compute the actions. And that's this policy function phi. Right? So, if you do that, then you're able to implement these components of this model, and you're able to do any observation. You can figure out what the best action is, and then you can, you can continue on this loop. Right? So you have to compute all these different components of, of this model. So let's look at the, each of them in turn. So you could look at uh, how do you compute these uh, these beliefs. So that's where the state estimator comes in, right? So basically, when I compute this posterior probability, the, the belief of uh, what the particular overall the states that you might uh, have in the world, given all the observations you've made so far and all the actions uh, you've taken so far. Uh, so how do you do that? Well, you use, use Bayes' rule, right? Or Bayesian inference, if you want to call that. So this is something we did yesterday. It's very similar to the same to the equation I had yesterday, except only difference is now you also have actions. So your transition function depends not just on the previous state, uh, but also on the previous action that, that you took. And then basically you can use this equation to update the belief at time t given the belief at time uh, t minus one. And so you can look at one of them as the likelihood of the other as the prior. So you multiply them together, and k is a normalization. Uh, constant that just makes sure that the b's, uh, the b, b t sums to one, uh, and so this is something that uh, is basically in hidden Markov models. They call it a forward propagation or a forward algorithm, right? Uh, it's also the same equation you use in a Kalman filter or a particle filter. Basically, it's the standard Bayesian uh, equation for updating your state uh, as a function of your current input, which is the O t is your current input, and your previous belief that you have, which is the b uh, t minus one. Okay, so the same equation. Here, so uh, you start implementing it. You can do it in a discrete setting or a continuous setting, depending on 
what model you're assuming for your, uh, uh, for your observation model and your transition uh, model. Okay? So very, very standard equation. And I think yesterday I talked about mapping something like a neural network to this equation. So this was basically just a, a slide from yesterday. So if you have a simple model such as a linear integrator model for how neurons behave as a function of their inputs and as a function of their uh, uh, feedback from other neighboring neurons, you have an equation that looks something like that. And you can map it to this equation we had before in the previous slide by just doing a logarithmic transformation. So that's one way of implementing this base and inference update equation in a neuronal network. There's other ways of doing it. So people have suggested other ways in which you can do this kind of base and inference using networks of neurons. So, so I think this, this neural computational beliefs, uh, uh, there's multiple ways of doing it. And we assume that uh, there are uh, networks that, that, can, that can do uh, this particular uh, computation. Uh, but the, the other interesting component here is how do you compute the value from, from rewards, right? So the monkey is just getting uh, rewards and penalties, right? But it has to compute the expectation, right? It has to compute uh, what it expects to get uh, for any particular belief uh, state. And that's this value function that you have to learn. So here's what that looks like. So the value of any particular belief, uh, state B, right? Uh, it's a function of the policy. The pi is the, the policy that you're currently using. So that's given by this expectation. So this, this expectation over uh, basically k equals 0 to uh, any time in the future. And it's, a, it's conditioned on the current beliefs. So that's bt equals you know, whatever belief that you, you have right now. right? So how do you actually solve this problem? Right? So how does a monkey uh, compute this, this infinite sum? Right? It's an infinite sum. Right? How do you do that? Yeah. What fixes the value of gamma? What fixes the value of gamma? Of gamma? Yeah, so gamma right now, I mean, uh, I'm just allowing it to be anything between 0 and 1. But like I said, I mean, when you actually try to fit it to the data, it'll, it'll turn out to be some value specific for the monkey or for the human. Right? So at this point, I'm just allowing it to be some value. Right? Uh, so the, the, the interesting part here is that uh, this is actually related to uh, something called the, uh, the Bellman equation. So those of you who know dynamic programming and, and Bellman, right? So you can rewrite this equation in this particular form, which is a pretty clever way of doing it. Just expand it out to the next time step, which is b of t plus 1. And then write it as a function of the current value is as a function of the current reward that you're getting at t plus 1 plus gamma times the same uh, function for the next uh, time step. So p of t plus 1. Yeah. In, in the, you know, the other dynamic uh, state space models, yeah. the, the, there's a signal to uh, noise ratio, which is uh, the system evolution variance over yeah. the observation variance. So here your reward and, and the punishment uh, can play the role of, of that uh, of, of that uh, signal to noise ratio, which one can specify, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you could sort of look at it that way. I mean, the, if you look at the equation that I had in the previous slide, it, it, it sort of takes into account uh, if you, you derive it for, let's say, a common filter, then you, you do get that signal to noise ratio as the common gain. The common gain term is basically the reward to noise. So, in some sense, it's already incorporated in that belief update equation. Uh, but then the reward and punishment gives you another way of uh, uh, sort of figuring out. So, given that belief that you have computed using the uh, let's say the, uh, the belief update equation, then how do you actually figure out the act? Okay, so, so here's the uh, one way of rewriting that equation. Nothing's changed, it's the same equation, except now I've written it in a way that it's a function of the same, uh, uh, it's basically uh, having the same function here, but at time t plus 1. Right? So if you wait, if you look at the, the neighboring so at time t and time t plus, t plus 1, you can compute those two values, right? And then you can figure out how do you, uh, you can try to optimize uh, that particular uh, function, define the parameters of this particular function by just optimizing uh, this particular equation. So here's what you end up doing. So you could learn this, uh, this value function by just minimizing the error between the, the value at, for the bt plus 1, and what you're really trying to approximate is this value, which is the reward that you got in the current time step, plus whatever your prediction is for the next time step, which is b of t plus 1. Okay, so if you wait one time step, get the belief at that point in time, and then you compute these two values at bt and bt plus 1, and you can use uh, this, this error to guide you towards figuring out what that function is based on the rewards that you're getting. So these are the rewards you're getting at that point in time, t plus 1. Okay? So it's an approximation to trying to figure out what that value function is using just the rewards that you're getting at any point in time. Okay? So it's a, it's a standard way of uh, uh, computing these kinds of value functions that goes in, uh, that, uh, that's actually used in uh, reinforcement learning theory. Yeah, but what is squaring? What was Oh, squaring is just uh, one uh, way of uh, trying to minimize the error so that you don't have to depend on the, the positive or negative values, right? Okay, so, so you, yeah, you could, you could use other kinds of reward, uh, other kinds of metrics also if you need to, right? But it also helps you when you do the uh, uh, duration of the, the learning rules, for example. Okay. So, so here's one uh, way of in which you can start to compute the, the value function. So there's basically a, a network that uh, essentially takes the belief at the input, and the output is basically the uh, prediction of the value for that particular belief state. And there's two sets of parameters. One is this 
uh, hidden layer, and there's another output layer here. So these are the so-called synaptic weights that you're, you're trying to uh, learn from the data. So as you get rewards uh, and as you get your belief states, you're going to update those two parameters. And so you can do that by minimizing that uh, error function that I had in the previous slide. Okay, so, uh, so you can do that, for example, using uh, something called gradient descent. So most of you are probably <coughs> familiar with that. Right? So you have an error function. It's, a, it's like an energy function, right? And you try to minimize and find the local minima of that. You can do that by doing gradient descent. And there's two parameters. One is that, is that layer of weights. The other is this layer of weights. And so you can do those. Uh, you can derive the, the learning rule for those two. Uh, and then update them as you get the rewards and as you as you go into the task. Okay? And for those of you who really love the mathematics, here's the equations. Right? <laughs> just taking uh, partial differentials and, and just updating those two. So these are just updated uh, online as you get the rewards and as you're computing the uh, uh, the belief and so on. Okay. And the interesting thing here is both of them depend on something called the temporal difference error, which is the, the difference in the prediction of the, the here's the reward uh, for that time step t plus one. And this is the prediction of that reward. And so depending on how big the error is you're going to adapt the weights accordingly. Right? So if you get a positive error, it's going to be a positive update. If there's a negative error, you're going to get a negative update. But basically, you'll try to correct the, the errors so that over time, it'll, it'll get better and better at, at predicting the value. OK, okay so the last, last part is uh, computing the action. So once again, uh, given the value function, you're able to pick the best action to take at any point in time. And so how do you do that? So once again, you can have this network that is, again, similar to what we had in the previous slide, except now it's going to compute the probability of a particular action. So this is just one way of doing it. It'll give you a probability of a particular action condition on the, the belief. And the parameter you have to learn here is, again, this, this set of weights, Q of, uh, in this case, for each of those nodes, the, the connection between that and, and the output action. And so for each of these actions, it'll give you what the probability of, of that particular action is. OK? How many minutes time? 10 minutes? OK, I think we have a little bit of uh, so once again, uh, you, can, you can basically use this temporal difference error to update these weights. And so eventually what you'll get is, uh, it's actually related to something called Thorndike's law of effect in, in psychology. So what that means is, if there's a particular action that will get you more reward, then you strengthen that particular action. Uh, so that you're going to repeat that more and more in the future. Okay? And if there's a particular action that's going to give you less reward, it's going to give you a penalty, then this will end up uh, reducing the probability of that particular action. So basically it's a very common sense uh, way of, of choosing your actions, where you're maximizing the reward in the long run. Okay, okay so enough of the, uh, the technical details. Right? So now I'll get into the actual results. This will make it even more intuitive than, than what we had before. So first of all, is there any sense to all this? Right? So is there any way to map it to the biology at all, or is it just a, uh, you know, a creating castles in the air? Right? Uh, so let's look at the components. Right? So the network I had in the previous slide <laughs> had the input as being the belief. And then there was this so-called belief uh, uh, points, which are these, uh, uh, these, these values that we're, we're learning from the data, right? And then the output of that network, this was the hidden layer, and the output of the network was either the action property or the, the value. And both of these were uh, uh, being used, right, uh, to compute the action. And then finally, there was one component called the temporal difference error, which was being used to update the, the actions and the, the hidden layer weights. These were the, those, those, the error in the prediction, right, the temporal uh, difference uh, error, right, that's called the TD error. And finally, the action was being used then to update the belief. So you had this kind of recurrent uh, uh, update of the belief based on the action that you took, right? So at a very high level, you could look at uh, the anatomy of the, uh, of the cortex and the uh, particular nucleus called the uh, basal ganglia in this particular way. And so there is a way to map some of the components to particular aspects of, of the brain. And so once you've done this mapping, you can then figure out, OK, what about the components? Do they actually map with the predictions of the model or not? Right? So if the model predicts something about a particular area, so in this case, the belief and the cortex, then can you actually look at a recording from the cortex and see if it behaves in the way that the model predicts it should behave if it is really computing the belief? Right? Or if you take this TD error, you can make predictions about how this temporal difference error behaves. Is that similar to what was labeled as DA over there, which is basically something called a dopamine response in, in the brain? So, Dopamine is a particular uh, neurotransmitter that is really sensitive to rewards. So do we, can we look at the responses of these uh, dopamine neurons and see if they behave like the temporal difference error? So let's go to the task, uh, go back to the task and see what happens if you apply this, this, uh, this, this model to this task. So once again, you're trying to figure out the direction of motion. The coherence controls the task difficulty. So here's what we get, right? So if you look at the, uh, the value function as a function of the belief, right? So this is the belief in the rightward direction. So you, uh, you can have a value between 0 and 1. So initially, you say, OK, they all have 0 value. After learning, you get something that seems sensible, which is that if you're really uncertain about your belief in the direction of motion, you have low value. It's like a negative value. And if you're near the two ends, which is that the belief is either 1 or 0, you have very high value. 
right? which means that the belief state which says I'm really certain means that I expect to get more reward. If I'm really uncertain, then I expect to get less reward. So pretty, pretty sensible, right? So uh, the network has learned that yeah, it's, it's good to be in these two zones of high belief in, in left or rightward, and bad to be in the zone that says I'm really uncertain. I don't know what's really happening. Right? So that that seems intuitive. Uh, but more interesting is the actions that it shows. Suppose I'm right? wait. What's that? Suppose I should be wait sometime. Yeah. So so that's what the uh, the policy tells you, right? So the policy is what actions should you take given the belief I have, right? So once again, the x-axis is the belief. In this case, in the rightward direction, right? Belie believing that the motion is rightward. So initially, they're all equally probable. The three actions: so choose right, choose left, or sample and wait for one more time step. But after learning, what you get is uh, interesting because it says as long as you're not sure, which is the belief is between let's say 0.8 and uh, uh, between 0.2 and 0.8, let's say, the high it's highly likely you'll choose the sampling action, right? So basically, wait, 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 wait. Right? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's happening. As the belief enters the zone of the zero or the one, which means it's, if it's zero, it means that you should choose left. Makes sense, right? Because the belief in right is zero, which means the belief in left is one minus that, which is highly likely to so choose left. Similarly, if the belief enters that zone, uh, then you choose the right action. Right? So basically, what it's telling you is that uh, depending on how uncertain you are in your brain, you're going to wait, wait, wait until you uh, are really sure about the direction of motion, and then you're going to uh, determine uh, you can choose one of those two actions on left or right. So pretty sensible. Uh, and the interesting thing here is at what point you transition from waiting to making a decision depends on the reward function, right? the penalties and so on. So if you have uh, a very strict penalty for making an error, you're going to wait longer. Right? You're going you're to be more, uh, uh, you want to be more sure about uh, your direction of motion, so maybe you'll actually end up only at the zero or one level at which you, you make the decision. Yeah. Why are there any mixed strategy, uh, strategies above? I don't understand why at a certain point degree of belief here you won't execute one or the other. So over yeah. here for point, uh, point 0.1 and point 0.9, there's yeah. a mixed strategy. Yeah, so if you recall, uh, uh, the way that we choose the action is probabilistic, right? So one of the things that this animal has to do is it has to do exploration, right? So it, has to, so it, it cannot be always deterministic in its actions because the reward contingencies might change, which is something that happens in the real world. Is, you, know, you might stop getting reward for you know, making the right eye movement. You might start saying, okay, you, wanna, uh, you get rewards only if you make a left eye movement. So even if you're very, very sure, you have to allow for a little bit of uh, uh, exploration possibility. And so uh, in this, at least in this particular model, it allows you to do that. It lets you explore the space of possible uh, actions and rewards so that in the, in, the, in the contingency that something changes in the world, you'll still be able to adapt to it and then eventually convert to the right policy. So here's the total rewards of function of time. So that's expected. It sort of goes up and that fluctuates at some particular level of, of, of reward. Uh, just showing that it's learning something over the course of time. But so um, you're saying the reward, expected reward is lower if, if, if you're not sure. No, no, I mean, if you go back, because I didn't really understand your answer to this question. Yeah. I mean, if that little bar there, yeah. would you mean, you go to? You mean this one? Yeah, so the, yeah. the penultimate one and the second one in the one above. Yeah. And Kuhn says, why are those things not either 0 or 1? Why are, they, why are they somewhere between 0 and 1? All the other ones are either 0 or 1. Why are there any ones that are not yeah, it's, 0 or 1? Right. So, I mean, the, this basically says that there's some <coughs> chance that, that, that you, you'll still go to, to left, even though it's, uh, you're not completely sure, right? You're some particular belief of point 0.2, you'll, you'll so still make. So you think if I would make that one 0 or 1, uh -huh. I would get lower expected reward? Or is it just that your algorithm hasn't found the global optimum? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a Monte Carlo simulation, right? So obviously, there's going to be cases where it's not fully converged, maybe, right? So that's, that's, that's also true. That there might be some uh, uh, effects of the, the fact that this is an online Monte Carlo like simulation yes. algorithm. So it's possible right. because of that also. So if it converged, would it be symmetric? Yeah, so I'll show you one uh, sort of analytically derived one, which is the idea that it's going to be symmetric. Uh, so yeah, so here's some comparison. So if you compare the percentage correct is the accuracy to the monkey data, it's similar, it's not going to be perfect. So there's, you can see the monkey is almost 100% uh, at, at a higher coherency. So if, the, if, the, if there's less noise, then the monkey does really well. If there's more noise, it doesn't do as well, as opposed to a chance, 50%. Uh, the model is something similar, except that since we have this random as, uh, action selection strategy, uh, it's, it's not going to get you to the 100% until you, know, you have fully 100% coherent uh, uh, stimulus. Similarly, the reaction time is a function of noise. So the more, uh, the less noise there is, the, the less of the reaction time. So the reaction time goes down uh, as a function of the coherence. The more coherence uh, uh, gives you lesser reaction time, so that's expected. 
Uh, and here's one of the suggestions about the, the responses that you saw in the uh, this particle area for the light beam. So it seems to be very similar to this idea of uh, the belief in a particular direction of motion. So for example, if you're recording from a neuron that likes uh, a direction of motion that's leftward, then you can see that as a function of the noise, so 4%, 8%, 20% coherence, 40% coherence, you get these rapid rises in the belief state, in the belief in that direction of motion uh, towards some particular value, uh, in this case 0.9. And that seems to resemble in some way the, uh, the activity that you see in the, in the, uh, uh, in the brain of these monkeys. Uh, similarly, when the direction is opposite direction of motion, you have a decrease in the probability, so that's the decrease. And some suggestion that maybe those decreases are similar to the decrease in uh, the belief in that particular direction of motion. Uh, yeah, so, so one last thing that I'll uh, leave you with is the fact that uh, I've actually not given you the whole uh, uh, story here, right? So it's not just the direction of motion that's unknown, but even the amount of noise is unknown. The coherence is another random variable that is not known to the human or to the animal, right? So really what you need is a network that estimates the belief for not just the direction of motion, left or right, but also the coherence values, right? So some sort of coherence values that, that it has to maintain a belief for. So if you do that and you learn the, uh, the, this particular network, then you get some interesting things, such as uh, you, can, you can look at the belief as a function of uh, you know, uh, belief of the direction of motion, which is basically going up in one case for 8% and 60%. It takes longer for the, 60, uh, for, the 80 per, uh, for the 8% compared to the 60%. But more interestingly, uh, you can also compute the belief in whether the task is easy or hard. So it's like the monkey knows that this is an easy trial or this is a hard trial, right? Because the belief is over. The, the, the amount of noise there is in the stimulus. Yeah. So in the real world, sometimes the reward system itself will have some error. Yeah. And then you know you do the right thing and you, you still may not get the reward. Yeah. Yeah. So can that type of, of perturbation be introduced into? Uh, yeah. I mean, in this particular case, yeah, since it's a Monte Carlo uh, learning process, it'll it'll av try to average out over those kinds of stochasticities in the world. So in some sense, yeah, it'll basically on, on average, if the reward is consistently given for correct choices, <laughs> it'll still uh, find the right policy. So, yeah. May I clear that? Uh, yeah. What's the noise here? Noise. Yeah. So the noise is coming from the uh, uh, the observation model, right? So basically, it's a model of how the motion relates to the underlying hidden state and the and the coherence, right? So uh, you have to come up with a likelihood function that will model the uh, uh, the appropriate noise process in in the, in the area preceding this particular area. I think that yeah. the robot is sensing. Okay, yeah. kind of especially for the observation device. Yeah, yeah. So I, mean, I can come to that later, right? But basically, it's a, it's, it's a choice you have to make about how the, uh, the stimulus is affecting the computation of the of the direction and the, and the coherence. So that's basically the observation model in, 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 the, uh, in this network. Uh, so yeah, so I guess the take-home message here is that in addition to computing a belief for the direction of motion, the network also gives you a belief in whether the trial is easy or hard in the sense that it's a noisy trial versus uh, a, a, an easy trial, but the coherence is higher, right? In this case, there's only two coherences, uh, 8% and 60%. So you can see in both cases, for the two directions of motion, the dotted is one direction, the solid is another direction, it rapidly figures out that, hey, I'm in an easy trial right now, right? Or if it sees the 8%, the it says after a while, oh, I'm pretty sure now I'm in a very hard trial, right? So the monkey knows, even before it's figured out the direction of motion, which it just takes longer, it knows that it's in a hard trial or an easy trial, right? So it's this sense that you might get as you're solving the trial that, oh, this is a really hard task. I can't really do this, right? So it gives you the ability to, to now make decisions based on whether you think it's a hard task or an easy task. And so consequently, when you compute the value function as a function of both the belief in easy or hard, the belief in E is between 0 and 1, belief in the direction of motion is between 0 and 1, you can see how if you take a slice of this uh, according to whether you're easy or hard, you can see how the expected reward you get is more for the easy task than for the hard task. Right? So overall, you expect to get more reward if you're an easy than if you're in a hard trial. In the hard trial, you're not always going to get the, get the reward, so you have the expectation to be lower, so you have a, a lesser <coughs> expectation than for the easy trial. Once again, that's pretty intuitive. Yeah. What is 0 minus 50? And yeah, I mean, that's again a function of the, uh, uh, the simulation that you're doing and so on. So I mean, it, basically, all I want to take home, uh, what you take home in this case is that there's this relative uh, sort of uh, uh, trajectory of the, of the value function towards having a higher value on average versus a lower value on average for the easy versus hard, right? But the actual values themselves depend on the reward functions and so on, right? You, what, miss, what values? Miss, you miss minus 100? Yeah, so basically remember I'd be giving an, oh, you mean uh, over here, right? Yeah. So this might be a minus 100. Okay, because yeah, I have yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, th these two you have minus 100. Yes, That's the same thing. Okay, so how does this actually relate to the uh, uh, the anatomy? So here's one one particular comparison. So this actually also is pretty intuitive. So if you look at this temporal difference error, remember I said, sure. 
Uh, I said that the temporal difference is basically this, this uh, uh, difference in the expectation uh, of the reward minus the actual reward that you really got. So when you're in an easy trial, right, and suppose you actually made the correct choice, then the difference between easy and hard is going to be that for the easy case, right, what do you expect? You, get, you expect that you, you're predicting that you're going to get some reward, and it's an easy one, and you get the actual reward. So the difference between the actual reward and the prediction is going to be small, right? If you're in a hard trial, right, the expectation is, is lesser. Remember, the value function was lower, right, for the hard trial. So you expect a little bit of reward. When the, the real reward comes in, which is actually a pretty big reward, right, because the expectation is less. So once again, you're going to get a big, uh, you're going to get a big spike in that case. So that's what you would predict for the temporal difference error. And what about the error trials? And the error trials are the opposite, right? So you expect a big reward in the easy trial, and then you, you got, then you made an error, right? So you have no reward, so you get a big negative bump. If you're in a hard trial and you uh, expected a reward and you didn't get any reward, right? So again, you have a, a slightly lesser uh, bump. So if you compare this to the data from the uh, this, this dopaminergic neurons. Uh, you get something similar. So you see that as the uh, coherence decreases, which is that the noise is increasing, <coughs> you have a bigger and bigger peak for the correct trials, and then similarly for the negative, uh, for the error trials, you have a, a shallower and shallower uh, uh, dip in the, in the responses. So in some sense, uh, it, it's consistent with this interpretation that these dopamine responses are similar to uh, these uh, temporal difference in prediction, uh, which has been suggested by other people also. Okay. Okay, so I guess I'm, I'm down to one minute. Uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave you with one last previous fact. So this comes down to your question about the, uh, the time factor, right? So why, uh, how exactly uh, does this relate to, to time? So if you look at the responses for the monkey, well, one thing you'll see is that there's something going on at 0% also. So why is that? Right? So why should there be a rise in the activity at 0% when it's completely noisy? Right? So why should a monkey be making a decision when there's nothing going on in the screen after all? Right? Patterns Maybe, yeah. right, right. It depends on, it may depend yeah. on, like, suppose previously he has seen that he has got reward for claiming yeah. left more time than claiming right. So, randomly he can so it could be some biases like that, right? Maybe oh, he, he, yeah. morning he says the same thing. You get up three and then you can solve the same thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's uh, opposite. So, I'll just leave you with one time. We can discuss this in the coffee break, which is, Remember I showed you this, this, this graph here? I showed you this belief at the function of uh, uh, belief and then the value for each of the beliefs. I wasn't really telling you the whole story here. So if you look at this belief function as a function of time during the trial, what it really looks like is something like this, which is it basically collapses over time to be narrower and narrower, which means that as time goes on, it is better for you to actually make a decision and get out of this trial because you might get a better trial next time. Right? So here's what the real decision uh, uh, policy looks like, which is that Initially, during the beginning of the trial, you do a lot of sampling, but as time goes on, the sampling space reduces. So the reason of the belief in which you have to do sampling reduces, and this is something that has been called a collapsing decision threshold in the decision-making literature. And this makes perfect sense because this, this tells you that it doesn't pay to wait forever to make a decision. Right? As time goes on, you, you might as well collapse your decision bound and move on to the next trial because you might get a better uh, trial at that point. Wait longer than the delay. Yeah, so it's a function. This collapse is a function of the penalty that you that you give it and the reward, and, and so it's basically a function of that ratio between the correct versus the, the incorrect trials divided by that uh, negative penalty you give for waiting. But there right. is an asymptotic width of delay. Okay. Yeah, collapse to zero. it doesn't collapse completely to zero. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I'll leave you with that picture, and then we can talk uh, a little bit about that uh, uh, maybe in the break or in the next couple of days. Okay, so I'll take any questions. Thanks.